And uh, we appreciate that compliment that you had when we were, while we were up there doing worship. Don't you just love when life throws you a curveball? It's awesome. God is just so good, amen? I mean, I just can't begin to explain just how much God has shown up in a real and relevant way in my life. Especially since the last time that I was able to minister here at Jesus' Lord Ministries. And let, let me tell you, I, I'm not there yet. But then again, Paul said that he wasn't there yet, because he said, I have not yet apprehended which, what I have been apprehended for. And... Um, It is, it is truly a humbling experience when somebody else just, just says what, what God has laid on their heart to you. It just continuously, continuously shows up just how, how much and how real God is and how much He loves us and cares about us and what we do. Amen? Because worship shouldn't be just here. Shouldn't be just here. Shouldn't be just within the church. It should be everywhere we go. Every aspect of our life should be worship. Pointing, pointing our hearts, pointing our eyes, pointing other people's eyes and hearts to Jesus. Everything that we do and say should equal out to be an act of worship. And I'm just going to say on my personal experience, it's everything that I do, I know just isn't, isn't there. It isn't there yet. But I'm working on it. I'm still breathing. I'm still kicking. And everybody here and everybody listening is still breathing and still kicking. So there's work to be done within us, and there's work to be done wherever we go. Anybody can be the next, the next son, son of God. And I'm, I'm just going to say, ladies, don't be offended if I call you all the son of God, because men... We are the bride of Christ, okay? Just want to let you know. So, what God has given me to, to teach about is communion. And I know that Easter just happened a little bit ago, and the, it's, the, it's almost the end of the month, so traditionally... A lot of people take communion on the first Sunday of the month, which is fine. Um, you know, there's some aspects to communion that, that I'll go into that you know, God opened my eyes, and freely as He has given me, I freely give. I study it, I look it up, I study it, I pray about it, and when God says go, I go with it. And this is just one of those things. So, I don't know how long it's going to be, but I'll let the Holy Spirit decide how long it's going to be. Because I have, I have some information here that I know God wants me to relay. But everything else is really the Holy Spirit's time. Everything else, whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do, is fine with me. Whatever He wants me to say, is fine with me because my mouth is an instrument for him. So, Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together and, and fellowship and praise and hear your word and worship you, Lord God. Father God, 
we ask that you just let your will be done, Lord, in our life. We ask and we pray, Lord, that you let, you let the fire fall. We invite you into this place, Lord. We invite you into our hearts and our minds, Lord. Change us, Lord God. Change us radically, Lord God. Let us never, ever be the same, Lord God. Each and every time that we even pick up the Bible or pray or even go out to witness to people. Let everything we do change us radically for you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God. Use my mouth, Lord. Use my hands as instruments of just extensions of you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to go into uh, the, the, the Last Supper here. I'm personally going to go into Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. But it's also found in Mark chapter 14, 22 to 24, and also Matthew chapter 26, 26 to 28. I mean, any one of those. I mean, you could use any one of those. I mean, it's, it's all pretty much the same. Just discrete, minute differences. And in Luke... Let's back up to Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then Jesus said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of the God come. Uh, king, let me try that again. For I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, in my blood, which is shed for you. The bread is the body of Jesus, and the cup, the cup of, the cup of wine, is the blood of Jesus. Jesus himself said that, the body and the blood. So, what happened here? Jesus just, he just instituted the Lord's Supper by giving us something to remember what he did for us on the cross and at the whipping post. Because at the whipping post, he took the lashes by his stripes we were healed. He took that on his body. And as we're breaking the bread, we remind ourselves, it helps to remind us of what Jesus did physically, of the, of the agony he suffered at the whipping post and on the cross. Likewise, when you, when you partake of the cup, the cup represents the blood, the blood of Jesus that was spilled which was shed for you, all as an offering and a sacrifice, a f once a final sacrifice for sin, so that we can be reconciled to God the Father. That's what it is in the physical, and that's what it represents. But what is the spiritual applications of this? Because remember, everything that we see physically right here is a representation of heaven. For example, the tabernacle was a representation of heaven and also a representation 
which points to Jesus right here. So what exactly is the spiritual implications here? Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Because when God showed me these things, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it, it, literally, it literally helped me see communion in a whole different aspect. A whole different aspect. And it, I, I now I treat communion with much more respect now. And um, yes, it, it, it's 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 all right to partake of it once or thirty times a day. However, because you're doing it in remembrance of Him, just I'm going to warn you: do not partake of communion in an unworthy manner. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. And, you know, an unworthy manner can mean a whole lot of things. I'll just leave it up to the individual. And that's between the individual and God. Excuse me. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. Therefore, remember that you... Once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Brought near. What happens when, you're be, when you have been brought near to something? You, gain, you start to gain the attributes of that thing that you're being brought near. I'll give you an example. Fire. Can you please turn me down a little bit? Fire. When you get close to fire, you feel the warmth from the fire. Depending on how close you get to the fire, it might start to singe the hairs off of your hand. And firefighters especially, God bless each and every one of them, firefighters, every one of them, when they are done battling the blaze, they smell like smoke. You can tell. I mean, it's just all over them. It's all on them. In much the same way, when we get close to God, we start to, we start to express the attributes of God. Love. And all, that's all the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, temperance, self-control, and the like. How were we able to be brought near? By the blood of Jesus. When you were partaken of communion... You're actually drawing closer to God because you are partaking of something, the blood, that has brought you near to God the Father. It's an amazing, amazing thing, isn't it? When God showed me that, I had to repent. Because I was, I was doing things, I was partaking communion pretty much out of ignorance. You know, yeah, I knew that it, was, it represented the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. I knew that, and his sacrifice is, is, is my only hope for eternal salvation, but I didn't know why. You know, I'm, I'm the type of guy that if, if it is... If I am able to find out why, I would like to find out why. I understand there's certain aspects of faith that, you know, God just go, tells me to go somewhere and I'm, I do it without question. I don't need to know why. God will take care of that. But if, it's a, if it is available in the Word of God, I would like to know why. So when we partake of the cup, from the Last Supper, we are 
partaken of the blood that Jesus shed on the whipping post and on the cross, every drop, every ounce, every little itty bitty bit of blood that Christ shed, we are partaken of when we partake of communion and it is bringing us closer to God the Father. Verse 14, that's the blood. Now here comes the bread. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Who? For Jesus himself is our peace. Who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh, which is his body, he has done away with this. The enmity, that is, the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him, who, through Jesus, we both have access by one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, to the Father, to God the Father. This is one of the few verses in the entire Bible that mentions the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what's all this saying here? I'll tell you what it's saying. How many people, right after we take communion, how many people feel an overwhelming sense of peace, of serenity, of joy? How, and, and the list can go on. An overwhelming love. How many people have felt that after you take communion? I have. And I couldn't explain it. Who else could explain that? You know, the very first time I took, partook of communion, I was explaining to my mother what was going on, and she, she, didn't, she didn't know. I mean, I'm not knocking her. She just didn't know. I love my mom. She's awesome. You know? But she's got her problems just like we all do. So, when I was feeling this overwhelming sense of peace, it's because Jesus had brought together the old man and the new man, brought them back into one body, and presented us to God the Father, made reconciliation with, for them through the cross. What's the old man and the new man? Obviously, the old man is the flesh. The new man is the spirit. How can you make the new man, the spirit, uh, new again? Cleansing it, washing the water of the word. Cleansing it, washing it through the blood of Christ. Wash, making it all shiny. Shining him up all nice. And the old man gets done away with because the old man just can't handle the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus, and the just the overwhelming holiness of God. The old, old man just can't handle it. I mean, it is it is just profound. So every time you take partake of communion, every time you you're eating the bread, which represents the body of Christ, you're actually being, being reconciled into one new man through the cross and being presented to God, reconciled to God by Jesus. That is what this says. <coughs> and when you partake of the cup, which is the blood, you are being brought closer and closer and closer to God the Father. 
being brought near by the blood of Christ. That's what happens when you're taking communion. And believe me, I have seen people who take communion right after they take communion. They fall on their face, crying, weeping, wailing, repenting. Then again, I've also seen people, and I, I have, I've been one of these, where I, where I took communion, gave God thanks, and turned around and went about my day. But I was thinking about Jesus the rest of the time. So, if we move along here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 gives you characteristics of the old man and the new man. How do you know which one you're walking in? How do you know? You could also look in Galatians chapter 5, because it also has the fruits of the flesh, and the, fruits, the works of the flesh, and the fruits of the Spirit. It has both of those too. It has, the Bible is full of examples on what God is looking for in His children, in His people. And we can look at these examples, and then we, once we look at our lives and our heart through the, through the filter of the Bible, we, will, we should know what we need to do to follow God more intensely, to follow God with more passion and more desire. And if we don't know, we should pray to Jesus to show us. Pray that He shows us, and He will. He will show us. Because he is looking for a bride without spot, without wrinkle. He is looking for. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. I'm sorry, let's move up to chapter, uh, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. I'm going to pause there and say, how many people have we experienced in this day and age who are like that? Who are working all uncleanliness with greed. Verse 20, but you have not so learned in Christ, for indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, verse 25, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. What's it mean by being angry and not sinning? I mean, yeah, you can be angry. On the rare occasions, I'm pre I can get pretty angry. But it takes a lot for me to get angry. I mean, Jesus got angry. I mean, didn't he get angry with the money changers in the temple? Didn't he whip them all? I mean, ouch! <laughs> and there's another time where, where Jesus, Jesus got angry because he saw lack of faith. And that's in, that's in the book of Mark. So you can be angry, but don't act on that anger. Because you, you can very quickly turn anger into wrath. Especially if if you're angry with somebody, I mean, the other, I mean, if you're just angry with somebody, 
and you say what, what the first thing that com comes in your mind, uh, that, that's, that's come upon wrath there. I mean, yeah, you're not, you're not dealing with somebody physically, but you're still attacking them uh, spiritually and emotionally. Verse 27, nor give place to the devil. Let him who steals or who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. You know, it breaks my heart when, when Christians are, of course, are joking around with a whole bunch of filthy language, with a whole bunch of rude, crude, lewd jokes. Just breaks my heart, but then again, I also have to realize that I came from that that area. That's part of my testimony is that I used to be rude, crude, and lewd. I mean, my wife can attest to that. I hear her in the back saying, "Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm." <laughs> Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, but let, listen, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, which is loud quarreling or loud fighting, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So when you're partaking of communion, back, into, back to my first point. When you're partaking of communion, you're, drawing, you're actually drawing closer to God in the spiritual aspect. You're drawing closer to God both, both also, both physically and, and uh, spiritually. God is um, imparting to you peace. He is bring, drawing you near. And, he is rec and Jesus is reconciling you to God the Father. Now that, now that all these things have happened, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to go past the fact that, that you're already a believer, so you've already repented of your sins. I'm going past that. This is a believer that has partook of communion. What is going on with that? So, believer, right after you take of communion and after you have repented of all your sins, you should, you should be a new creature. You should have a different mindset. You should have a different way of talking, a different way of walking. Some of the old things, old habits that you have done in the past does not even appeal to you anymore, try as they might to come back upon you, you have the, the, the strength of the, of the Most High God to resist the temptations that have, that have plagued you for so long, for so, so, you have not so learned in Christ. So press on to the high mark. Press on to the love and the joy that Jesus is. Press on. It's a tough road sometimes. It's a tough road sometimes, and every I see everybody nodding their head. It's tough. Don't get me wrong. It's tough. It's tough to stay holy, stay pure, without being called a hypocrite. It's tough. Because you just mess up one time. It seems like if you just mess up one time as a Christian, the whole world will, will continue to point at that, at that instance. It's tough. But it is so worth it. It is so worth it. I know everybody here 
And I know you, those are watching, I know they, they have somebody that even when they're going through something tough, they're pressing on to the, to the joy that Jesus, to the love that Jesus has and wants to impart. Now what about some, a, a, a sinner, someone that's unconverted? What about them partaking of communion? Personally, this is just my personal opinion. Has has you know nothing nothing out of the Bible. This is just my personal opinion about a a sinner partaking of communion. I say let them. Why? Why let them? Because it's getting it's getting the seed of the Most High God inside of them. You know, God will deal with them. God will deal with that person. But, you know, sometimes we have, to, we have to do some radical things in order to reach people. You know, God has to do some, some intense things to reach people. And each one of us is different. My conversion is different from my wife's conversion, which is different from the people's conversions in here. We're all different. But we all serve the same Lord. We all serve the same Master, the same Savior. Oh, I almost, I almost forgot. I almost forgot the last part here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this is the last part, and I'll be wrapping this up here. I can't believe that, that that time limit has gone by so fast. Now, with everything that I have shared, yeah, here we go. With everything that I have shared, I, I I also have to give you the the warning. Also, I, I touched on this earlier, but I want to go into it a, a little bit more depth. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse twenty-three. This is essentially this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Verse twenty-three: For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took bread and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now here's the warning that I touched on earlier. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So essentially... You might as well whip Jesus and strung him up on the cross yourself. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, or many have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened, chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the wor world."
So, a lot of people, according to, the, according to this, the church of Corinth, a lot of people have been taking uh, communion in an unworthy manner, and a lot of, a lot of bad negative things have c come up. Many are weak and sick among you, and many have died. What is this passage saying? Examine yourself. Examine yourself. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. What does it mean to examine yourself? Whatever you absolutely know is against the will of God, get it out. Repent. Get it out. And that's the things that you absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt is against the will of God. Repent. Get it out. Seek deliverance from such things. Or else you're, you're going to drink judgment upon yourself. I mean, that, that might be, just a suggestion, that might be why the church is in the state it's in. Just, just suggesting, that's all. And, um, you know, how, how much more, how much more would we, how much joy, more joy would we have, how much more peace will we have when we seek after the Lord and put away, put away such things that we know is against the will of God, because we're not constantly looking over our shoulder. So in closing, when you, when you partake of communion, you're partaking of the, the body of Jesus, which has made peace, reconciled the old man and the new man through the cross and presented, presented us to God the Father. And when you partake of the blood, you're partaking something that has been, that has bringing you closer bringing you nearer and nearer to God the Father. When you're being brought closer and closer to God, you start gaining the attributes of God. But also, examine yourself so that you do not partake of communion in such an in unworthy fashion. Let's go, church. It is time. It is time. It is time for the real church to stand up. Games are over. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the eternal truth that it is. We thank you, Lord, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that we can digest what you have laid upon our hearts, upon our ears. We ask for discernment, Lord, and hunger and thirst for the word, Lord God, that your will may be done and that your fire may consume everything that it is not of you, Lord God. Fill us with your with your passion, your desire, your love, your fire, Lord. We, <clears throat> excuse me, we thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.